and the novices questions. The most interesting of the questions is the very first, what is one? And the answer is, all beings subsist on food. This is what defines us as beings, the fact that we have to have food. And for most of us, that's pretty much all our lives. What we consume is the big issue. Years back there was a TV show, The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And you didn't see any rich and famous people making their own things or showing off things that they had produced themselves. It was all what they had bought, all that they had consumed. And our culture really does tend to be a consuming society. One of my favorite New Yorker cartoons was one where a couple sitting in a living room talking to some friends. And one of the husbands is saying, well, of course it's had its ups and downs, but by and large Margaret and I have found the consumer experience to be a rewarding one. And when you come to the Dharma, many of us bring that attitude. We're used to consuming not only things, but also experiences. There's huge industry, what we call the experience industry, where they'll create experiences for you. Remember back a while there was the Ford experience? They weren't selling you Fords, they were selling you the experience of having a Ford. Park rangers talked about maintaining the Yosemite experience or the Zion experience for people to come and consume. And so it's understandable that when people come to the meditation, they think of it as something they can consume as well. We want the bliss, we want the pleasure, the sense of freedom. that we've heard that will come from mindfulness and concentration. But in order to consume those things, we have to produce them first. This is why when the Buddha starts his teachings on the most basic levels, he starts with generosity. It's the first of the perfections. It's the first of his teachings in what's called the gradual discourse, when he's leading people up to the Four Noble Truths. It starts with generosity and then moves on to virtue, the rewards of virtue in heaven, then find the drawbacks of those rewards. And then the value of renunciation. Once the mind can see that renunciation would be a good thing, then it's ready for the Four Noble Truths. In many ways, renunciation is a continuation of the principle of generosity. You learn that you have to give something away, give something up, in order to get something of greater value. So instead of encouraging us to come to the meditation as consumers, he encourages us to come as givers. What are you going to give to the practice? Some of the famous Sajans in Thailand talk about how the practice is one thing clear through. In other words, it starts with one principle and just carries it all the way through to the end. And it's this principle of giving. This is what raises us up beyond and above the level of just being beings that have to consume and that have to feed. Remember, the Arahant is someone who is no longer defined by any desire. And so it's no longer defined as a being. And even the Arahant's consuming of food is a gift. Those who give to the Arahant get rewarded many times over. So the Arahant is the only person who can eat the alms of the countryside and not be incurring a debt. So the practice is a practice of giving. 
from the very beginning. All too often we encounter talks about dana as basically a disguised request for money, which is why some people have a real aversion to the topic. But the Buddha had an etiquette around this. There's a story in the canon of some monks who were building huts, and they started getting into a contest with one another who could build the nicest hut. And so they're constantly asking for materials, workmen, and the householders are getting harassed with all the, the beg, begging and all the requests. When they'd see a monk, they'd turn away, they'd run away, close the door. As the story says, sometimes in the evening they might see a cow coming in the distance, and assuming that it was a monk, they'd run away. It got that bad. And so the Buddha called the monks together and gave them a series of stories about how people don't like to be begged from. There are two hermits living near a river, an older brother and a younger brother. And there was a naga, a very beautiful naga, would come up out of the river and just show itself to the younger brother. And the younger brother was scared of the naga. He had no idea what the naga's intentions were, and who knows what the naga might try to do to him. So he went to the older brother and asked him, what can I do to keep this naga from coming? And the older brother said, does the naga have anything of value? And the younger brother said, yes, he's got this beautiful jewel on his chest. So the older brother said, well, the next time you see the naga, ask for the jewel. So the next day the naga came, and as the naga was in front of the younger hermit, the hermit asked for the jewel, and the naga went away. The next day, as he was halfway up from the river up to the, naga, the, <coughs> the hermit's cave, he asked for the jewel, and the naga went away. And the third day, as soon as the naga came out of the river, he, the younger hermit asked for the jewel. And the naga said, okay, enough. I'm not coming back. You're asking for too much. And then, of course, after the naga stopped coming back, the younger brother missed him. It was kind of cool seeing a naga in your meditation like that. But by that time, he'd driven him away. So when generosity is presented as part of a begging talk, it's, it's not really welcome. And as a result, we miss the meaning of generosity, as things have to start with generosity. And it's not just giving things. You're learning how to give of your time, to you give of your energy. And you're changing your whole relationship. You're not just a being that's there eating and eating and consuming things and experiences. You're finding that you've got something inside that you can share, something you can give. There's a sense of wealth that comes with this. If all you're thinking about is consuming, is what can I get out of this, what can I get out of that, you're poor. No matter how much you have, you're poor, because there's always a big lack. But if you come to every situation with the question, well, what can I give? You're coming from a position of wealth, and you find that you do have reserves of energy and you do have reserves of knowledge that you can share. And in sharing, you, you gain a lot in return, a lot of more value. Because both generosity and renunciation are forms of trade. There's that passage where a monk says, I will trade what dies for the deathless. I'll trade what is limited for unbinding. You're trading up. You can't get the better thing without giving up the lesser thing. And so when you understand that, then you realize whatever you're doing in the practice, you want to come with the attitude of, what can I give? If you don't have material things to give, well, how about your time? How about your energy? How about your knowledge or skills? 
when you're dealing with other people, the question is not so much how much are they entertaining me or what can I get out of them, it's what can I give? What can I give to the situation? There are times when there's a lot of tension in the room, well, what, can you give some peace? Can you give some humor? Something to make it better. Virtue is also a gift, as the Buddha said, when you make up your mind that you're not going to harm anyone under any circumstances. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. You're giving limitless protection to all beings. In other words, at the very least from your quarter, they don't have to fear anything. And as you give limitless protection, you have a share in that protection as well. So virtue, too, is a gift. Meditation is a gift. You have to give your energy, you have to give your attention, develop your mindfulness. When you're focused on the breath, it's good not to hold anything back. Just think of yourself plunging into the breath and the body. Totally. And then the reward is that you have this all-around experience of ease, refreshment. If part of you is pulled back, there's a part of you that's not sharing in this, that's not gaining anything. of real value. So try to bring this attitude to the practice that it's all about giving. Ultimately you're going to be giving up your greed, aversion, and delusion. Giving up even your sense of self, or your many senses of self. You first you give up your unskillful ones and you develop the skillful ones, but then after you've worked all so hard in developing the skillful ones, well, the Buddha said, you've got to give those up too. But you find that there's a reward that comes from not hanging on. It's always trading up. But you can't trade up unless you start giving to begin with. Otherwise, if you're just in consuming mode, you're living off your old goodness. One of the Buddha's foremost disciples was a woman, Wisaka. whose nickname was Megara's mother. And it's not because she had a son named Megara, her father was named Megara. The reason she was called his mother was because she saw that he was just living off his old merit. He was just in consuming mode all the time. And she made him realize, and she had learned the Dharma from the Buddha, so she taught him that you're just living off all your old stuff, and if you don't create any new goodness, you're going to run out. And that was the teaching that convinced him to change his ways. And because she was his teacher, she was called his mother. She gave him the gift of Dharma. So remember, we're here to go beyond just being beings that are consuming all the time. We try to redefine ourselves, not by what we eat or what we own or what we consume, but what, by what we produce, what we can give. And it's by making this switch in the mind. It changes everything. Difficult patches come up in the meditation. You ask, you ask yourself, not, why is this so bad? Does this mean that I'm a miserable meditator? You say, no. What can I give to the situation that it does so it doesn't snowball? What resources do I still have? What can I draw on to give to the situation? to turn it into a different kind of situation. When things are going well, again, what do you give to make sure that it continues to go well? 
you know, just sit there slurping up the pleasure and the rapture. You're looking after them. You're giving your energy to protect them. So that as you get more and more into the giving mood, when you finally do have your taste of the deathless, instead of trying to grab onto it and hold onto it, which places a separation between you and that experience, you give up any clinging you might have around it. And that's how you reach the deathless. So in giving up, you're not being left adrift. You're giving up things of lesser value for things of greater value. But remember, the only way you can trade up is to be willing to give something in the first place. Otherwise, there's no exchange. 